The standard was really fucking high. And if you couldn't handle being in an environment with a very high standard, then it was gonna, it was gonna, it was gonna ruin you. And that was to get on the board at Westside and to be on the board at Westside at the time pretty well meant that you were gonna have to break the all-time world record because that's pretty much everybody who was on the board. Get the fuck up. Simon says, get the fuck up. Throw your hands in the sky. Some of the other things about Westside when I was there that I don't think people truly understand is the commitment that it took to be able to be there. So it had to be, let me step back because I don't want to misquote something. Louie had always told us to not make powerlifting our life, but for most of us there, it was. But that wasn't because he was telling us to make it our life. It was what we were choosing to do against his own judgment um, because he did not want powerlifting to become our total identity, which with most of us there, it did become our total identity. But there are also some, there are also some rules that were kind of part of all this and usually nobody had any problems with that. You know, if we started training at 8.30 in the morning, which is typically when we started, if you, if you got there late, you were gonna get thrown out of the gym. That was, that was a pretty hard rule. And I saw very elite lifters, very good lifters, get thrown out of the gym for that very reason. If, you, if your effort sucked and you were lazy, you were probably gonna get run out of the gym. And it would be, it would be by us, you know, because there was a certain standard that we were only going to be as strong as our weakest person. And if our weakest person's a tweet and he's not even putting forth the effort that it takes to try to become stronger, then that's just going to make everybody else weak and it's going to bring down the whole entire gym. So it was, it was more than, it was about more than just our own lifts. It was about Westside. So Louie had a statement of he knew what Westside could do for us. What could we do for Westside? Well, that's kind of what we did is you had to control that you know, to make sure everybody was striving to do their, their very best and beyond to become better. And if they weren't willing to do that, we didn't want them in the gym. And, you know, that's, is what it is. You know, there's, it's how everybody was. It wasn't a fucking recreational center. It was, it was, it was a place that it was hard to train at. There were very high expectations. And when I say it was hard to train at, Yes, we busted balls, we gave each other shit, we tried to get you know, under each other's skin. Louie was classic at trying to get under all of our skins to try to piss us off. But there was never any ill intent. The intent was always to try to make everybody else stronger, but the, the overreaching and the overriding theme is the standard was really fucking high. And if you couldn't handle being in an environment with a very high standard, then it was gonna, it was gonna, it was gonna ruin you because the standard wasn't gonna lower, you had to come up to it. And that's just the way it was. And some people, myself included, probably could never live up to the standard that was put out there. That doesn't mean you don't fucking do everything that you can to do it. You know, the, the stand, like I said, the standard's not gonna change because of who your parents were or what your injury history is or how fucked up you are or your work schedule or the standard is what it is. And that was to get on the board at Westside and to be on the board at Westside at the time pretty well meant that you were gonna have to break the all time world record because that's pretty much everybody who was on the board. So it was a high standard and rightfully so. The, when meets came around, you, 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 you did meets, you did not go there and train and not do meets, that was the first thing. The second thing is, if somebody was doing a meet, then the other guy's responsibility was to go help at the meet. And if they didn't help at the meet, they're gonna be thrown out of the gym. And helping at the meet during the time I was there meant you were shelling out the money of your own, your own money to fly, drive, or whatever it took to get to the meet to help those guys. So then they would be there to help you. So there was no prima donna bullshit, you know, when the, I don't want to say tiers, but when the lower tiered lifters were competing in state meets, um, then the higher tiered lifters had to go help and vice versa. 
and you didn't lift in a meet you weren't qualified to lift in. So even though there were times and opportunities where some of the lifters were presented the ability to be able to lift at a meet that they didn't qualify for that year, Louis still made him go qualify, even if it just because that's what the, what the rules said. And if they weren't willing to do it, then they weren't going to do the bigger meets. And so that's that's kind of how it was. So it was very. That's where the hard part of it came a lot of times because there were for all of us, there's, you know, there, you don't want to go to meets every fucking weekend, but sometimes that's what you had to do. And that's the way it was. Now there were fewer meets too. So we would decide, you know, here's, here's where the top tier lifters are going to go. Here's where the you know next tier lifters are going to go. And then the only time it became an issue is when we didn't have second tier lifters anymore. And then it had to be, you know, who's going to compete in what meet and so forth. And it always got worked out, but it was usually always decided by a pecking order of, of whoever was the strongest helped to make the rules. So, you know, if you were the strongest, you were helping to make the rules and without changing the standard. Now to get to some of the questions in regards to the training, the, with the circumax phase, what I, and this is getting to what I do now. What I do now is I, I'm really, really cautious on even using a circumax face for people. I want the technique to be dead on. I want, I'm still a big believer in the box wide. I want that technique to be dead on. I want everything to be rock solid before this is even a consideration. Then when it is a consideration, I want it to be a mutual understanding that they know exactly what it's going to be because it changes the dynamic of the whole training cycle. So as the question said before, you know, things are going to have to change on max effort days to accommodate for that circumax. You know, the wherever the training is being done during the circumax needs to be at the same place with the same bar, with the same bands, with the same monolift. It can't be done in three different cities with three different types of equipment. It has to be consistent during that entire phase. There's there's all those little nuances that have to be in a place because when you're talking circumax, you're talking above 100%. So you start dealing with shit that's above 100% at the top, you need to make sure there's gonna be spotters. You need to make sure there's gonna be people in there to run the monolift. You know, it's, it's very, very hard to do if you're not using a monolift. You know, if you're you know, a raw lifter today and you're not using a monolift, a circumax is gonna be a really fucking hard thing to do. It's, it can be done, but it's going to be really fucking hard to do it. And the tensions may have to change and some be some combination of band and chain. The, the other question about, uh, there was the, the cycling of the program. You know, one of the statements that's been made several times is that there's no cycle to West Side. It has, it doesn't have any type of phasing or any type of phasic structure where it does. You know, the dynamic effort cycles are all cycles that cycle in this three week wave period or a five week wave period in its own right. And then the max effort, it's working up to a single. It's essentially what max effort is. So that's cycling every day, or I'm not every day, but every week. And then maybe sometimes that's going to have to be pulled out because of a circumax or because of other training goals are going to supersede what that maximal strength is going to bring. And the goal of the max effort day isn't just to strain, you know, it's to teach somebody to recover from a chaotic situation. So if they, you need to know how to strain. You need to know how to think when you strain. So if you do get a squat or a deadlift or a bench that's a grinder, you just don't hit that spot and stop. You got to know what technical changes to make if you hit that. So if you're only getting in that environment or in that place four times a year or four times every six months, if that, you're not going to know what the fuck to do. So that's the whole purpose of the max effort method. And the max effort method, keep in mind, doesn't use the lifts that you're going to compete in. 
they use modifications of the list you're going to compete in, which makes it easier for you to recuperate from to be able to do it more frequently. So as soon as you start throwing in a competitive squat, bench, and deadlift on those days, you're going to run yourself in the ground within a couple weeks. It has to be variants of that. What those variants need to be, they can be specific to the individual if you need be. They should have some dynamic correspondence or carry over to the squat, bench, and deadlift. But the fact of the matter is, it, you just have to fucking strain. That's, that's, anybody who's got any questions about what they're supposed to do, it's just strain. That's it. And you don't want to do any more than two to four reps in the 90% plus range. Sometimes people make this way, way too complicated. Sometimes that involves a little backward thinking. If you're using a board press, for an example, and you work up and you hit a 405, or just make it simple, you hit 400, and it was hard. It was definitely in a 90%-ish range. And then you look and you see that your last set before that was 360. So you went from 360 to 400. Well, you know the 400 is in the 90%-ish range. You might have a little bit left. Well, 90% of 400 is what? Not the 360. Is that right? My math's not working real well. Nine times four, three. Well, it is 360. So it's right at 360. So that could count as two lifts in the 400 you'd be done. Now, if you went from 355 to 400, now you only have one lift in the 90% range. So that's where I tell the lifter to throw a five on each side and do one more. You know, so you don't have to exactly know what your PR is for each one of these lifts going into the lift because that's gonna change day to day, week to week, hour to hour, symptom to symptom, you know, it's all the time. But you can definitely use your own perception and your training partner's perception to be able to make these audible calls to be able to get two, for an advanced lifter, two is enough. Two, two lifts in the 90% plus range. If it's an intermediate or beginner, gonna pull it down a little bit. Maybe you can go four lifts, which could be a double, single, single, something along those lines. So the max effort exercise optimally should change every week. If you're very, very young beginner, then you can go a triple one week, single one week. But personally, I still like to see it change every week and always be a single because there's less likelihood that you're going to get hurt doing a single than you would a triple. And that's, I've seen that over all my years of training. You know, the only time I really ever see anybody get hurt on a single is going to be at a meet or when they're doing the competitive lift in a gym, you know, when they're not really supposed to or they're working up when they're not supposed to. The supplemental exercises are typically going to change every three to five times that you do the movement, however you decide to do that movement. The accessories can change usually every four to six um, weeks because that's where you're talking things like push down, side raises, stuff like that. They still have to change because wear and tear is wear and tear. So they all have to kind of change with that. The that's basically the general principle. The, the article I have on a general template is through the eight keys, which also discusses the importance of having a dynamic effort method, a repetition method, and a max effort method. This isn't just some shit Louie came up with. You know, if you want validation of it, look in science and practice of strength training, look in super training. They're both explained in detail there. Uh, some of Bumpa's materials are also explained there. So it's the importance of these three different ways to increase muscle tension is, in my opinion, vital when it comes to the importance of developing maximal strength. So I'm gonna cut it off there because I do have a whole seminar video on the site, which is old as hell, but probably needs to be redone at some point in time, but I can talk for hours on this. So I'm gonna cut it there with the West Side and the conjugate stuff.